right, we're going to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We went through chapter 5 last week where the preacher had been uh, on a discourse of the uh, continuing discourse of those things that he felt w could leave someone empty. Um, potentially, he, he talked about uh, hasty vows. You know, you wouldn't think that religious deeds or religious acts could leave someone feeling empty. And yet he saw many times how those vows were were made but not kept. He saw people making hasty promises and commitments as they came to the temple, and he thought, that, that doesn't mean anything. And then he got into to the politics of things and about the king and um, how, you know, even someone who achieves um, such great heights in this world uh, still is dependent upon the produce of the land. I mean, even the king... You know, the, the, the preacher here could say that there is higher than they. There, he that is higher than the highest regardeth. Uh, and then he talked about riches. Um, and, and how riches potentially could be, could be empty. Obviously, there's plenty that you could do with riches. There's plenty that you could do with money. And yet he spoke of those that stored up riches to their own hurt. Those, those who were consumed by wealth, just, just the idea to accumulate and just to have. He came to two different conclusions at the end of chapter 5. In verse number 18, he said, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. If you've worked hard, if you've accumulated, if you've earned Enjoy that. You know, don't, don't put a whole bunch of stock in it. Just enjoy it. Um, you know, it, it could be gone. You, you read through the passage. He talks about how quickly it could be gone or how quickly someone else could come and take it. Just if you've got it, enjoy it. It's fine. And then the second conclusion in verse 19 was actually a degree better where he says, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Even better are those that just have things, but those that God has given the ability to enjoy those things. And that's a blessing. He considered that to be a blessing, that, that not only was someone uh, accumulating, not only did someone have, but God gave them the power to enjoy it. Um, and he said that was the gift of God. So those were some fairly wise, especially as you consider his perspective, looking at things from an earthbound view. That, that's great. That's, that's pretty good advice. Uh, enjoy what you've worked for. Work hard. Enjoy the fruits of it. Uh, pray that God give you the ability to enjoy and to rejoice uh, in, in what he's allowed you to have. But today... He's going to talk about the opposite of that. So if, if those were the conclusions in chapter 5, when chapter 6 opens up, he's going to give us the opposite. If chapter 5, verse 18 and 19 are the good, let's look at chapter 6, verse 1. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men, a man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all he desireth, Yet God giveth him not the power to eat thereof. Number one, a perspective on riches. Again, chapter 5, verse 19, ended with the thought that God had given, but not just given the things, God gave the enjoyment of those things as well. And yet in chapter 6, he opens up with the, the opposite thought of that. You have the man that has. He has plenty. It says there that he has wealth. He has riches. He has honor. And yet in this verse, he mentions, yet God giveth him not the power to eat thereof. Here's your opposite. You have a man who has it all, but he has no capacity to enjoy it. You know, there, there's no lacking. It says there that he has, um, 
he wanteth nothing for his soul of all he desireth. You know, he doesn't have to say no to anything. He has the money to pay for it. He has the means to accomplish all that he would or all that he would want. But he doesn't have any capacity to enjoy it. And we have seen that, right? There are men who have it all. There are men who have all of this world has to offer, and yet they're miserable. You know, we're able to see that in men, that, that wealth, wealth is no security of, of happiness. People that attain honor, people that attain high positions, um, that's, there's no guarantee that those people are going to um, be happy, be able to enjoy it. I mean, you just look, you look at our country. You look at the way that we're structured. There are rich people that, that aren't any happier than poor people. There are rich people that have and have so much, and yet they are consumed by the desire to, to accumulate more and more. There, there's no joy. There's no enjoyment of the things that they have. There are people that have attained high positions. You know, there are people that are in power. We have people that are you know, that have attained the office of, of president or they're, they're in Congress and, and they've attained these great and high positions and, and they're as mean and as nasty as you could possibly be. The, these, these high positions, these high honors did not give them a good perspective. They are, they are still um, unhappy, unfulfilled, constantly wanting more. And, and he says that this is a sore evil. This is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it's common among men. This is something that across the board in all generations, men have found that power and wealth and honor still often leaves men unfulfilled because God did not give them the power or capacity to enjoy it. It says, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. There are men who by experience have found out that it is possible to have all this world can offer you and still not be happy and still not enjoy it. And he says that this is an evil disease. You know, by and large, why, why would you say it that way? Well, you know, by and, world, by and large, this world teaches that those things are the end goal, Right? The goal is to get the, to the end and have accomplished something. Either have the, have the money or have the honor or have the position and the notoriety. All of the things that this world says are worth achieving and worth pursuing. Solomon's like, no, listen, men in every age have found, even after accomplishing all these things, that when God didn't give them the power to enjoy it, they still felt unfulfilled. He says that that's just that is an evil disease. That is a tragedy that this world puts so much stock and investment into these things that still might leave you unfulfilled. You know, we, when we talk to our children or we, we try to give counsel or advice to, to to any maybe younger Christians that would look to us. Um, we want to make sure that they put stock and investment in the things that are worthwhile. Because Solomon would know by his own experience and would tell all those that are listening, you can chase and pursue a lot of things and catch them and still feel empty and still not feel like it was worthwhile. Of course, there are things that you can pursue. There are, there are lifestyles that we can live, uh, lives that we can live in service to others in service specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ that would, uh, that would certainly leave us more, more fulfilled than other pursuits in this world. He said it's an evil disease. Now, if those men are so miserable, the question again becomes, well, what's the point, right? Now you look at verse number two and it says, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity. And you say, oh, see, now that's what, that's what the problem was. That's what Solomon's talking about, right? You've got the man that's accumulated so much, but then a stranger takes it. He doesn't have anybody to take over for him. See, now that's what the vanity is. That's, that's where the emptiness is. And Solomon would keep going and tell you, no, because actually verse three, if a man beget a hundred children 
and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. You might look at verse 2 and be convinced that the vanity is because a stranger came and ate it and consumed it all. And he says, well, well, what about the guy that lives a long time? And he has a lot of kids. What about that guy when the Lord doesn't give him uh, the capacity to enjoy it or his soul be not filled with good? What, what about him? What about the man that lives a long time, has plenty of kids, and yet he still doesn't enjoy life? He doesn't find fulfillment or enjoyment or happiness that he seeks. This guy here in verse number three, it says, and also that he have no burial. You know, you would think that if you've lived a long time and you have a lot of kids, um, maybe you've made an impact on someone, right? Or that there is someone that would take stock, take notice of your death and at least provide you a proper burial. This guy doesn't even end up with a proper burial. Um, that of an untimely death or a stillborn, he says it's better than he. Now, now he's getting back into the cynical nature of things. Remember in previous passages where he spoke about those, the, the dead being better than the alive, maybe even those that were never born better than both of those. Notice here in verse number four, the one of the untimely birth, it says, for he cometh in vanity, he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness and his name shall be covered with darkness. When he speaks of um, the one of untimely birth, he has a name that's covered in obscurity, right? The, uh, of an untimely birth or stillborn, you know, who knows, you know, there's nothing about this, you know, this, this child is just consumed with obscurity, you know, you, you don't have a time of birth. You don't have a time of death. You don't have anything that you know or could say about this child. And yet he's saying that that kind of child is better than the guy that lives for 100 years or, or he lives for years and he has 100 children. And yet he has not been filled with good. The verse number five, it says, Moreover, he hath not seen the son, nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. You know, the one of an untimely birth um, that, that never actually sees the sun. He never actually experiences the, um, the lifestyle that can be so maddening. Um, he speaks of him as having more rest. People, um, people live in turmoil. Um, people are consumed with so many ideas um, that there's no rest. And he says here that this hath more rest than the other. In verse 6, yea, though he live a thousand years, twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. If a man lives for a thousand years, twice told, if he, if he lived two thousand years, but he has no joy, how is he better? How, how is that man better? He says, I'll go to one place. You know, he's made a very weird comparison, hasn't he? He's talked about the one that was of an untimely birth. But now that he's laid it out here, he's talked about, okay, you tell me. A man that has lived 2,000 years and yet has enjoyed no good, has seen no joy in his soul, has seen no joy in the things that he's accomplished, explain to me. Do not all go to one place. I mean, is his end any different? And, and he, obviously he's talking about the grave. He's not talking about heaven and hell here. But he's, he's talking about, you know, he's going to find the same end. And so the, 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 the one that, of an untimely birth, the one that never actually gets out of the womb to live, compared to the guy that lives for 2,000 years and he has 100 children and yet has never seen any good, He's, they both ended up in the same place. They both ended up in the grave. And he's not convinced that that, that that life is better. He still thinks that there's perhaps an emptiness that is there. That's certainly a different perspective than the one from chapter 5 where he came to the realization that, you know what, that's actually pretty good. If God has given you the ability to work and to accumulate, enjoy it, 
Even better, when God gives you the ability to enjoy it, and now he's come to the realization that, you know what, because if God doesn't give you the ability to enjoy it, and you live, and you work, and you think you've accomplished, and you've, you've accumulated wealth, and honor, and riches, and all these things, but there's no joy, there's no good, there's no enjoyment of those things, buddy, you're going to die, and there's just not going to be much that's, that's there to say about your life. Surely a guy that has lived a hundred to see a hundred children or that has lived for a thousand years twice fold um, gets to the end of his life and somebody has something to say about him. And yet his comparison is to the, the one of an untimely birth. That, that's that's kind of that's a vicious comparison there. Verse number seven, all the labor of man is for his mouth and yet the appetite is not filled. And that's pretty simple. Right. I mean, obviously, in every generation, what is the main reason that men work was to provide? It's certainly to um, to work so that we can feed our families. The, the trouble with that, obviously, is that 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 never ends. Right. That is a continuous work. The appetite is never satisfied. Um, you know, we went to the grocery, took, took a couple of the kids yesterday. We went to the grocery and for sure next Saturday We'll have to go again. Sometimes you have to go more than once a week. Sometimes um, it just doesn't last. And you work, and you go to the grocery, and you bring it home, and you feel that sense of pride that, you know what, I I'm taking care of my family, I'm doing something that's worthwhile, and yet that, that becomes a cycle. Right? It's a cycle that never ends. We did. We went to the grocery yesterday, but you know I got to go to work tomorrow because um, what I bought yesterday isn't going to last long enough. So we got to keep working. And the labor of a man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? So in this, you know, in light of what we've seen in some of these passages, he kind of questions here um, whether the wise is better than the fool, right? For what hath the wise more than the fool? Um, they're both in the same boat, right? Both are subject to the same, to the same struggles of life, right? The continual necessity of, of working to provide, um, that, that's for the wise man and for the foolish man. The, the, this potential struggle of working and accumulating and not being able to enjoy it. Um, you know, if, if this is a battle that's common to man, if those things in verse number one are true, that it's common among men, then in verse number eight, what hath the wise more than the fool? Does he really have an advantage? Uh, obviously, he has no advantage because he's not coming out any further ahead. In verse number nine, better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also, uh, this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. He speaks here of how it would be better to be content and enjoy. If you can, be content and enjoy what is in front of you than to continually crave what's not. Some folks are forever chasing the carrot that's on a stick in front of them. And he's... He looks at it and, and he comes back to this idea of contentment and the enjoying of what God has given you or what God has gifted you. It would be better. Better is the sight of the eyes, right? That, that which you can see, that which is in front of you, than the wandering of desire. There, there are some that are never content with what is in front of them. There are some that live in pursuit and in desire of that which they cannot even see. You know, they're, they're chasing a dream. They're chasing something that's not real. He speaks of the wandering of desire and says that that's empty. That's vexation of spirit. That's chasing the wind. Contentment. Uh, we talked about it last week. The, the Bible does, um, specifically in the New Testament, give us great advice about contentment and our satisfaction, uh, primarily our satisfaction being in Christ and then, secondarily, with the things of this world, 
being content because we have a, a different perspective. We are sure that we brought nothing into this world, that we can take nothing out. If God is blessed and provided us with food, raiment, housing, shelter, being content with those things, and also living on the promise that Christ gave us not to leave us or forsake us. Verse 10, that which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. It's been named already. Right? We, and we've talked about it throughout all of these passages. Different comparisons have been made. Rich, poor, old, young, wise, foolish. But ultimately, in all of those cases, we are talking about men. And he says, neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. Um, how, how could any of us dispute with our creator? with our maker, with the one that is mightier than us. Seeing then, verse 11, seeing that there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? Which man is better? He's gone through and talked about, you know, the rich man and the poor man. Now the rich man has, and he has plenty, and he has wealth, and he's accumulated great. He's not any happier. And in chapter 5, he spoke about how he lays awake worrying, and he's chasing that which is next. And even, you know, he that loveth silver is not satisfied with silver. Um, is he any better than the poor man? I don't know. It, it, it doesn't sound like it. If God's not given him the ability to enjoy it, it certainly doesn't seem like it. Uh, all of these things. Then what is man the better? Verse 12. For who knoweth what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? Now, after six chapters... Here's where he's at. Verse 12. Who knoweth what is good for man in this life? He's just, you know, in all the comparisons that we've made, the old, the young, the rich, the poor, the wise, the foolish. You almost get to the point now where he's, he's like, I, I don't even know what to say anymore. I have, he's, been, he's been able to see in all camps paths and perspectives that, that lead to unfulfillment, that lead to, to no lasting happiness or joy. And, and certainly you would think, well, it's certainly better to be wise than to be foolish. Or uh, if nothing else physically in this world, it'd be better to be rich than poor. And yet now that he's done doing all of his comparisons and doing all the analysis, he's not even sure of that anymore. He's not even sure what to tell a man is good for the man in this life. All the days of his vain life, which he spends as a shadow, we understand that, right? Man, if, if life is short and if death is certain, man, it, it's almost like he staggers like, I don't, I don't even know what advice to give. I don't even know what to say. You know, the Bible does tell us that our lives are like a vapor. We live in this world for just a very, very short time. And, and, and the writer here, the preacher uh, in Ecclesiastes is staggering, um, and all of the things that he's seen are empty and vain. And for a moment, he questions whether or not he even has any good advice to give. Now, number two, let's talk about a better perspective, because that's kind of a sour way to end chapter six, the thought that perhaps man is unable to determine what is best for him under the sun. But Solomon does have some ideas. He does have some thoughts um, regarding some things that are better. Again, we know that his perspective is not, um, his perspective is not necessarily one that we would take across the board in all things. He's looking at life as it is. He's looking at things as they are in this world. And yet, no, as discouraged as it was at the end of chapter six, and, and I thought for a moment, man, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what the good advice to give man is. A moment of caution, a moment of pause and thought 
Chapter 7 is going to open and he's going to say, no, there are some things that are better. Okay? There are some thoughts here. So let's look at this better perspective. Chapter 7, verse 1, a good name is better than precious ointment. Brother John mentioned this just recently when he was preaching. He gave the sister verse there in the book of Proverbs about how a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And of all the things that had discouraged him in the previous chapters and of all the things that he worried about and saw as struggled and empty, he's still able to say, no, you know what? It is still good for a man to live such a life as to have a reputation of good and honest character. Now that is a perspective that is even seen and taken under the sun, right? That a good name, a good reputation, a good character is better than precious ointment. You know, precious ointment speaks to that which is costly and fragrant, and there's just not much that you can compare to an honorable name, right? And we, we don't have to belabor the point here, Brother John, um, just this past week had preached on that, um, that a good name is better. And the day of death than the day of one's birth, he says there. Now that, that's, that causes you to question a little bit. Um, about what he's talking about there. You know, is he thinking about the man that has a good name? Um, now, again, this, this perspective is different because you and I would both know that the day of one's death is not better for everyone. You know, certainly, you know, if we were to think of men that leave this world um, unrepentant or unforgiven of their sins, and they leave this world without the Lord Jesus Christ, um, the day of their death is not better than the day of their birth. Um, but it does seem maybe that he's looking perhaps in view of what he has just mentioned, that, um, the day of their death, you know, the one who has a good name, um, the, the end of one who has a good testimony, the end of one who has a good reputation, that the, the end of one that was known as being wise, um, that that day is better than his birth. You know, that there are some that when the end of their life comes, and you're able to look at who they were and what they accomplished. Um, there can be some good thoughts there. Now, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. This is the second thing that he's, uh, his advice. He thinks that even after all that he's said, no, I, I, I still think this is better. I think it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Now, why would you think? Um, now, we may not agree with that. Um, and there may be some days that we agree with that more than others. But by simple earthly comparison of the funeral and the feast, he comes to the conclusion that it's better to go to the funeral. And here's his reasoning. Um, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. His, his conclusion is that because death is the end of all men, because death is, um, is a path that we're all on, it's something that we'll all experience, um, coming face to face with it makes men think, right? Um, certainly, men are probably more contemplative, more cautious, more thoughtful um, in the house of mourning than they are in the house of feasting. And if, if it makes you come face to face with reality, if the house of mourning makes you come face to face with what your ultimate destiny is, which is death, um, and it makes you think and it makes you contemplate those truths and it gives you a somber thought and it gives you, um, you know, a motive with which to live life, that might be better. Might be better. Uh, he says that the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow, verse 3, is better than laughter. Now, the preacher seems to be convinced here that seriousness accomplishes more 
than, than levity, right, or foolishness. He says sorrow is better than laughter. And now it, it does seem true that um, sorrow may sharpen the mind to consider and wrestle with the great issues of life. You know, when things are light, when things are just silly, when there's a lot of fun, when there's a lot of laughter, there's not a lot of concern, right? There's just not a lot of focus or concern on the serious things of life. But he mentions sorrow being better than laughter. You know, when there's sorrow, when there's trouble, when there's discouragement, um, men are more, again, contemplative. They're thoughtful. They're thoughtful about the serious issues of life, about death and sickness and the important things. And he's like, you know, and if that's true, then I would assume that sorrow is better than laughter. Now, I would say that that would depend on your situation. Um, but again, he's got a different perspective here. He says, by the, and his reasoning here is, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. You see, he's thinking here about the developmental aspect of sorrow and how sorrow, um, by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. You know, the Bible does tell us that in the book of James specifically. It talks about our temptations. It talks about our trials, the trials of our faith being developmental in our spiritual life. The trial of our faith worketh patience, and we're supposed to let patience have that perfecting work or that growing work in us. It is true that during times of trial, temptation, and struggle, our faith is tried, and our faith grows more than it, than it does in times of ease and times of plenty. So there's a very real aspect. There is a very real sense in where we are cultivated more and we are developed more in times of sorrow than in times of laughter. Perhaps that's what he's getting at here. Sorrow is better than laughter. By the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Verse four, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of of mirth. <clears throat> the heart of the wise, you know, the, the heart that is able to maintain poise um, when it's surrounded by death. The heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You know, the, fools struggle with crisis. And, and there are folks that would rather, or there are folks that would rather avoid those things because they're not equipped to handle it. Um, we, we've all known folks that, that maybe it's their lack of ever being around it or their continual desire to stay away from those things. Um, there are folks that struggle. They struggle greatly in the house of mourning and they would do all that they could to avoid those. Um, now, none of us enjoy that. All, all of us would, if we could, would like to avoid the house of mourning as much as possible. But he says that the heart of the wise is there and the heart of the fools is in, um, is in the house of mirth. Eventually, wisdom teaches us uh, about sorrow and about its reality. Um, and he's cautious there to tell us that that might be better. Verse number five, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. I thought about um, Brother John and what he had mentioned um, previously, um, speaking about the wounds of a friend. Um, something similar to that here in this passage says that it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise. You know, the rebuke of the wise would tell us that constructive criticism instructs, it corrects, and it warns. But he also says here, for them, then for a man to hear the song of fools. You know, the empty praise and song of fools really accomplishes nothing of lasting value. No one wants to be rebuked. No one wants to be criticized. And yet the criticism or the rebuke of the wise does more in your development. It does accomplish more in your life than the empty, vain praise and songs of fools. Now we're running out of time. I think we're probably going to stop there. Um, but you can kind of see that Solomon, even in his earthly wisdom, at the end of chapter six, he's like, I don't even know what to tell you anymore. 
I, I've, seen, I've seen both sides. I've seen all that men struggle with. I've seen how men of all races, of men of all abilities, men of all classes struggle with all of these same things. And at the end of the day, wise, foolish, rich, poor, I don't even know what to say. And after a moment of calm, it's like, no, okay, there are some things that are better, okay? It, it's, it's good to have a good name. It is good to spend some time in seriousness. You know, if, if it doesn't matter, right, if there's no, if everything is vain and if nothing matters, we would all come to the same conclusion that just enjoying it and filling our lives with laughter and mirth and that that that, that would be the most important thing. And, and he's like, no, no. A life spent with a good name and time spent in seriousness, whether it be at the house of mourning or, or even dealing with your own personal sorrows, there, there are developmental tools there. There is a path that it seems to be wiser and better. In, in all of his discouragement and all the things that he's seen about, man, I'm not even sure what matters anymore, and everything seems empty, at least after a moment of thought, he's able to say, no, you know what a good name does matter. A good name uh, is not empty. It's not vain. It is actually worthwhile to accumulate a good and honorable name and live your life with a degree, an aspect of seriousness and contemplation about reality and what is to come. Okay? We, when we talk to men and women, um, we want them to see that there is a great seriousness of life. I, I love to kid around. I love to have fun. Even, even some of my silliness is foolish at times. Um, there is an aspect where we get serious. We focus on the realities and the truths of life. Um, and there's, there is wisdom in that. Okay, so some things do matter. I, I know he's been really crusty and cynical and nothing matters. Um, you know what? Some things matter. I'll tell you what matters is having a good name. And what matters is when it's time to be serious about the truths and the serious things of life, um, the ability to do that, the ability to look at life seriously. All right, we're out of time. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful to come today. We are grateful to be in your house. We're